today. Um, we're having the last of a trilogy of presentations on killer whales. Um, last month we heard about uh, echolocation in the capture of prey of uh, fish-eating killer whales, um, and that was killer whales on the northwest coast. The month before we had a talk on population structure of killer whales around Australia and New Zealand. And today we're going to hear about killer whale call repertoires from killer whales um, in the Northeast Atlantic around Iceland, Norway, and Shetland. Our speaker today is Ms. Anna Seldman. Anna is currently a PhD student in biology at the University of Iceland. Uh, not surprisingly, she's working on acoustics of killer whales um, for her PhD, although she's also working on uh, killer whale interactions with pilot whales. Um, the paper today is based on a paper in marine mammal science with a title similar to Anna's talk. Her work is part of a broader project um, called Icelandic Orca Project. And if you look on the website, uh, society website, you can see uh, a link to that. I will also be posting the, uh, looks like maybe it, a link has been posted to the uh, website for Anna's paper. It turns out Anna's paper is in the uh, October 2020 issue of Marine Mammal Science, which is uh, an issue that is open for a full year. So access to that paper uh, is available whether you're a member of the society or, or not. So with that, I'm gonna turn uh, things over to Anna to give her presentation. Anna. Thanks, uh, Daryl. Can everybody hear me and can you guys see the screen? I guess so. Yep, looks good. Okay, cool, thanks. So yeah, thanks uh, for inviting me and thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks to you guys uh, for tuning in. So I'm going to be talking about uh, killer whale call repertoires in the Northeast Atlantic today. And as uh, Daryl mentioned, this is based on a this presentation is based on a, a paper which was published earlier this year in Marine Mammal Science. And of course, I wasn't working on this by myself, but I had a whole bunch of co-authors, uh, some of which were my supervisors on this project. Um, and I would like to acknowledge them here as well. So first, a quick introduction um, to acoustic communication and to killer whale vocalizations. Um, so if you think about acoustic communication in the most basic sense, it's the sharing of information. So usually um, a signal is sent from one animal, which we call the sender, to another one, which is the receiver. Um, and the information that is transferred in this signal helps the receiver to decide um, on a response. And um, the response then usually uh, affects both the sender and the receiver. So um, acoustic communication is really important uh, in animal behavior. And many animals use highly stereotyped sounds to communicate because that's more efficient if you use the same type of sound uh, over and over again. So. Uh, one example that you probably all know is the songs of birds or of humpback whales where they use very stereotyped sounds in a specific order. And especially in the marine environment where there is very little light uh, and sound propagates much more efficiently uh, in water than in air, so it makes it a very uh, useful way to communicate. So like many other ma marine mammals, killer whales uh, are very vocal and their vocalizations are usually divided into three categories. Uh, and here you can see a spectrogram of, of these different categories. So we, we uh, speak of the clicks, the whistles and the calls. So in the spectrogram, you see uh, how the frequency 
changes over time. So it's basically just a visual representation of sound. Um, and you can see that the clicks are very short pulses of sound and they are typically emitted in series and uh, they are used for echolocation. So they function in prey detection and localization. Then uh, at the end here, you have two whistles and these are tonal sounds and they're usually a bit higher in frequency, uh, usually around six to 12 kilohertz. Um, and most of them are variable, but some are also stereotyped. And these appear to function in the close range communication. So they facilitate and coordinate social interactions. Uh, there are also whistles that were described in much higher frequencies, up to 75 kilohertz. And uh, we know very little about them, but it's possibly that possible that they also play a role in short range communication. And then in the middle here, you can see a few calls. And uh, so those are the sounds that I'll be focusing on today. So these are burst pulse sounds, and they consist of rapidly repeated pulses. And the interval between the pulses is, is much shorter than in the echolocation clicks. So that's why these calls appear tonal to, to us. And they have most of their energy between 500 hertz and 25 kilohertz. And they can contain two separately modulated uh, frequency contours. There's an example later on where you can see that uh, a bit better than here. So we, we call that the, the two components are called the low frequency and the high frequency component. And what's interesting about the calls is that the majority of them is uh, highly stereotyped. So that means we uh, can divide them into categories and uh, that allows us to describe the call repertoire. So I'm gonna to try to play this for you. So first you'll hear a couple of clicks, then you hear a few calls, and then at the end you can hear the two whistles. Uh, they're a bit high, high in frequency, so it might be a bit more tricky to hear, but let's see. So why are these calls so interesting? Um, the repertoires of these calls, they are not universal. So they vary between populations and ecotypes. And in some populations, uh, the call repertoires are uh, even group specific. Um, and the calls are thought to be learned rather than genetically encoded. So it's thought that the difference in the repertoires um, uh, kind of accumulates as, as groups split apart. And in these cases, we can use the call repertoire as a measure of maternal relatedness. And we can try to look at that within populations, but also across populations. Uh, so for example, in one of the first extensive studies of killer whale calls, uh, John Ford found that in the North Pacific resident population, different uh, pods share different parts of the repertoire uh, with other pods. So you can see, for example, here that all of these pods, uh, they share some part of their repertoire. And so they form one acoustic clan, which is clan A, but they don't share any um, calls with this other clan, clan G here. But within the clan, there is some, some call sharing. So basically, uh, the closer related the groups are, the more calls they will share. So this means that we can use uh, acoustic repertoire analysis to examine the population structure and the maternal relatedness. Uh, you can also try to look at that between different populations. There were fewer studies who have tried to do that. Um, but they could be really useful to determine the population connectivity, uh, as well as to indicate evolutionary forces leading to the repertoire differences. 
So one study, for, for example, um, from Australia uh, was published in 2015, and they described vocalizations from Bremer Canyon in Australia, and they found some similarities to calls that had previously been described from the Antarctic. So this indicated that there might be some connectivity between these whales. However, geographical distance does not necessarily correlate with repertoire similarity. So there might be other factors involved. So for example, a study by Filatova and colleagues uh, compared the repertoires of four North Pacific resident populations and they found that the geographical distance uh, did not correlate with, with uh, repertoire similarity. So why is all of this interesting in the Northeast Atlantic? So here you can see um, a map of, of the study sites that we looked at. So we were looking at three locations, um, Iceland, which had two uh, study sites, Norway and Shetland. And the whales in these locations, they are very similar. So they have similar morphology, similar ecology, they are very similar genetically as well, and they show some similar behaviors and also uh, acoustic behavior can be very similar. And um, the occurrence of killer whales around Iceland and Norway in particular is associated with uh, North, North Atlantic herring movements. And there were several studies that have suggested that they specialize on herring as their main prey. They do feed on other things as well, but uh, mostly on herring. <clears throat> and it is thought that there was a continuous distribution of killer whales between Iceland and Norway before the 1960s due to the distribution and movement of the herring. So the Atlanta Scandian herring stock um, migrated between Iceland, Iceland and Norway. So, and as you can see on this map here, uh, catches from, from whalers indicated that the distribution of killer whales was basically uniform between Iceland and Norway and also the, towards uh, Shetland. But then in the 1960s, uh, the herring stocks collapsed and the migration of the herring uh, across this area stopped. And what was left of the herring retreated uh, much closer to the Icelandic and the Norwegian coasts. And photo identification studies that were conducted from the 1980s onwards didn't find any matches between Iceland and Norway. So it seems that there's little or no movement today. Uh, however, we know that there is a small part of the Icelandic uh, population that regularly moves between uh, Iceland and Shetland. So in the first studies, there were a handful of individuals that were um, identified in, in both locations, but today I think there are around 16, and every now and then we've, we find another one. So um, what about the acoustic behavior of these whales? So they, they have very similar acoustic behavior. So for example, when they um, feed on herring, they have high rates of echolocation and calling, but they are mostly silent when they travel. Um, we also have these high frequency whistles that I mentioned before that were recorded in Iceland, Norway and Shetland. And uh, at least between Iceland and Norway, they also have very similar properties. Uh, the call repertoires in these locations have been studied to varying degrees. So there was an early study uh, by Moore and colleagues in the 1980s that suggested that calls from Iceland and Norway had similar frequency, but they didn't find any uh, call type matches between these two locations. But the study also had a relatively small sample size, especially for Iceland. Um, then in the 1990s, uh, Hannes Trager, she created a relatively extensive catalog for uh, Norway. And she found two call type matches from Norway 
to the Icelandic calls described by Moore and colleagues. But she also described matches to the Canadian resident population and Alaska. And then in 2011, uh, Deakin colleagues created the catalog of calls from Shetland and they found that there were two call type matches to Iceland. But as I said before, uh, especially these older studies, they were based on relatively small sample sizes, especially for Iceland. And so that hindered a more thorough comparison. And also the data was collected uh, in the 80s and early 90s. So it was really time to update uh, this comparison. So our objective was to create an updated comprehensive comparison of the call repertoires in these three locations to provide insight into the relatedness and connectivity of these whales. So uh, our data was collected between 2005 and 2016. And the data came from a variety of projects and were collected using different methods, but we wanted to include as much as possible to provide the most comprehensive comparison. Um, most of the data came from single hydrophones and hydrophone arrays, but also from uh, D tags and uh, a bottom mold hydrophone in Iceland. So once we had all the recordings, uh, we audited all, all the recordings and assigned each call equality. So you can see an example at the bottom here of, of low, medium and high quality sound. And we only included the high quality calls in our study. Uh, we then classified the calls based on uh, visual and oral inspection. So the classification was mostly based on the shape of the call contour, uh, the number of subunits, um, to a smaller degree also on the duration of the sounds, but also to uh, the oral qualities. And wherever possible, we compared the calls or our call categories to, to the previous catalogs and we retained their naming and numbering system. Uh, we also took uh, measurements of the calls. So uh, here you can see actually an example of a, a call that has a low frequency component, which is this, this part here. And then you can see it has a separate high frequency component, which is this shorter line here. So we measured the fundamental frequency of the low frequency component at the start, uh, at the end, in the middle, at the maximum point and the minimum point. And from the start and end, we also got the duration. And we chose these parameters based on a review of the published literature. And we, the aim was to select commonly used parameters to maximize the comparability between studies. Uh, we also attempted to describe the call complexity. So that was based on whether the call uh, did or did not have uh, the high frequency component and also uh, based on the number of subunits. Uh, so as you can see at the top, uh, a subunit was identified by an abrupt shift in the frequency or sometimes there was a very small uh, silent interval. So this is what we um, ended up with. So we had three catalogs. So for Iceland, we had a bit over 8,000 uh, high quality calls that were divided into 43 call types and 31 subtypes. Uh, for Norway, we had a bit over 3,200 calls uh, that were divided into 32 call types and 22 subtypes. And for Shetland, we used the catalog that was previously published by Dick and colleagues, uh, which had 13 call types and two subtypes. And then we compared each call type from each location to each call type from the other two locations. Um, and we defined a match in, in a call type as high similarity with complete or nearly complete match in the frequency contour uh, including similar oral qualities. And 
we didn't find any matches between Iceland and Norway or Shetland and Norway, but we found three matches uh, between Shetland and Iceland. And two of these had already been identified in this previous study, uh, but with the, the increased sample from Iceland, we found the third match. Uh, there were eight call types that we defined as possible matches. And these were mostly, uh, so these mostly had a very simple frequency contour and they had a large number of calls within the category. And there was a lot of variation within the category. So it was uh, only one or two calls that were that um, showed similarities to the other locations. So that's why we couldn't confirm these as matches. And I'm just going to show you some examples of uh, the matches we found between Iceland and Shetland, just so you have an idea what they look and sound like. So this is the first one here from Iceland and from Shetland. And the second one here is uh, actually a quite interesting call because it's the so-called herding call. So in Iceland and Norway, killer whales feed by encircling the herring and they swim around it and compress it into a tight ball. And then they slap the tail into the herring. So that stuns the herring and then they, they feed on this herring. And in Iceland, usually before we hear a tail slap, very often we can hear this call. So it is thought that the call might be directed at the herring and might uh, make the swim bladder vibrate and make the herring bunch even closer together. And the same one from Shetland. If I can get it to play. And then this last match uh, might be a bit more tricky to hear because the quality isn't quite as good. Yeah, so these were the matches. Um, and then we also, as I said, we also took uh, measurements of uh, time and frequency parameters. Uh, we couldn't include Shetland into this analysis because there were just too few calls uh, that were um, high enough quality to get measurements of all of the parameters we measured. So uh, we could only compare Iceland and Norway here. So we had a bit over 5,700 calls. Um, and we didn't, there, there was a significant difference between locations for all of the parameters uh, that we measured. But you have to consider that most of the parameters were also had some correlation. So for example, in an upsweep call, the start and the minimum frequency would be the same. Um, but you can also see from this graph here that there was high overlap in the parameters we measured and we had plenty of outliers. So we tried to see if we could use a discriminant function analysis uh, to distinguish between uh, the two locations, but it only classified about 55% correctly. So it didn't perform uh, that well. And then we looked at the call complexity and I'm just gonna try to point out here. So, in Iceland, most of the calls had only one frequency component, uh, but um, most of the calls also had two or more subunits. In Norway, uh, about half of the calls had two frequency components and about half had only one, but the majority of calls only had one subunit. So I'll come back to this later, but it's quite difficult uh, to interpret this result. So just a quick um, recap of the main results. So we found that there were few call type matches, uh, especially to Norway. 
So this kind of suggests that there was a divergence in the repertoires, but the general repertoire structure and the time and frequency parameters were relatively similar. So let's first look at the time and frequency parameters. Um, so we, we had a low distinction in, in these uh, parameters that we measured, uh, and that's actually consistent with previous studies. So there haven't been an awful lot of studies, but uh, for example, this one here by Phila Tova and colleagues showed uh, that the frequency parameters are similar across oceans, but they may vary between ecotypes. So for example, they found that in the North Pacific transients, uh, the North Pacific transients, they have overall a lower uh, frequency in their calls than the North Pacific residents or the North Atlantic killer whales. Um, and our results also suggest that within the North Atlantic, uh, locations are not clearly distinguishable from these parameters, at least for Iceland and Norway. Uh, so this seems to be quite the coarse metric, the frequency, time and frequency parameters. <clears throat> um, when we look at the call complexity, uh, as I said before, Iceland, uh, uh, in Iceland, most call types had two or more subunits, but only one frequency component. And in Norway, most call types uh, had only one subunit, but about half had one frequency component and about half had two. So it seems that there is some difference in the structuring of the calls, but it's very difficult to interpret these results because we know so little about the function. And this is something we would really like to investigate further and in more detail across populations uh, to see if there are some general rules uh, for killer whale communication or for how these calls are sort of built or put together. Um, yeah, now we'll look quickly at the call type uh, sharing. So the lack of matches to Norway uh, and some matches between Iceland and Shetland uh, supports our current knowledge on the movement patterns of these whales. So we know that a small fraction of the Icelandic population regularly moves between Iceland and Shetland, but uh, to date there has been no confirmed movement between Iceland and Norway. Um, as I said, there were eight call types that we considered possible matches, and these call types had very simple frequency contours and a lot of variability, uh, which is why we couldn't confirm a match. Uh, so it is possible that with a larger sample size or a better understanding of the call function or an improved classif classification method, uh, we will have to reassess these calls in the future. Uh, but even in entirely, in entirely separated populations, there is a chance uh, for similarity due to the physical constraints of the sound production apparatus or just due to random convergence. But what does it mean? Um, as I said in the beginning, uh, the killer whales in Iceland and Norway were thought to have been in contact before the 1960s. They are genetically closely related. They have similar behavior, similar ecology. So we could have expected actually some call type sharing between these two. But the consistent difference in call repertoires that was suggested by this study and also in previous studies indicates that if the populations were in contact in the past, they might not have been one totally mixed population. And this is mainly supported by the fact that uh, killer whale call repertoires are thought to be highly conserved. So they are thought to be stable over a very long time periods, several decades. So the time frame of about 50 to 60 years between the herring stock collapse and our study would not have been enough for two completely separate repertoires to have evolved. Um, and furthermore, there are other signals, acoustic signals, 
that are not present in both populations. So one is the herding call that I showed you before. Uh, it was recorded, is recorded quite uh, frequently in Iceland, uh, but has never been recorded in Norway. And also uh, Icelandic kittle whales produce low frequency sounds that have not been reported uh, from Norway. Um, but herring is a very uh, variable prey source. Um, so it changes, uh, it can change quite fast uh, in which locations uh, it goes and where it migrates. And uh, in recent years, it has actually been found again close to the Icelandic coast. And we had a lot of sightings uh, recently of killer whales offshore of the northeast of Iceland. So there is potential for renewed contact. So we really want to further monitor uh, these areas and we need further photo ID uh, studies and acoustic monitoring. And this is also one of the limitations of this study that um, we didn't really have any recordings uh, from the east of Iceland or from any of the areas in, in between. So this is something we uh, want to do now in the future. So yeah, with that, I would like to thank the reviewers of the paper, uh, the editorial staff, and also the society for inviting me. And also, of course, my co-authors and the funding agencies, and you guys for listening. Well, thank you for uh, that interesting presentation, Anna. Um, we'll now open up uh, uh, the opportunity for questions. I, I put a note in the chat that question should be directed to the Q&A. And uh, I think, uh, Teresa, will you or Eric be monitoring questions? And uh, if so, uh, whoever it is, would you go ahead and start out? If not, I've got a couple of questions I can ask. Yeah, I can ask a couple of questions that we've had so far, and I encourage people to keep asking more. Um, so Carrie is wondering, um, is the catalog figure available in the supplementary material, or will it be made available in the future? Um, I think it was not in the supplementary, but at least for the Icelandic one, you can check out the, the website here that I put just on the last slide. And you can find the catalog there and you can find two versions of it. So we have one that has just the spectrograms and um, some explanation of the catalogs. Um, and then there is another version that also has sound files included. So you can also listen to some of the calls. And uh, the Shetland one is published in the paper by Dick and colleagues. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, another question from Carrie, uh, is the Norway population with lower frequency calls also fish eaters or mammal eaters? I didn't understand the first part. The, um, the Norway populations with the lower frequency calls, what is their diet type? Um, maybe I misspoke or maybe it was a misunderstanding, but the ones with the lower frequency calls were the North Pacific transient killer whales. So these are mammal eaters. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Seems to. Okay. So maybe I'll, I'll follow up on a similar sort of question and this is probably just my ignorance here, but uh, are, uh, is there sort of greater social communication amongst mammal eating killer whales than fish eating killer whales or vice versa? And, and how, how does that, uh, is that reflected in call repertoires? Um, I don't know if there's greater social communication in either or the other. Uh, there are definitely differences in that, for example, uh, during feeding, the, the fish eating killer whales are usually much more vocal because their prey is not so sensitive to their sounds. Um, while the mammal eating killer whales are very silent when they hunt because their prey 
has similar he hearing frequency, so they would uh, detect them. But um, at least for the North Pacific, as far as I know, these uh, group-specific repertoires, they have only been reported uh, or are like more pronounced in the fish eating killer whales. But the, the transient killer whales, they, um, they use a more broad repertoire that is, that is shared between more, more groups. If that makes sense. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, do we have more questions from the audience? Yeah, we have a couple that just came in. Um, we have a question of, did you extract the frequency points by hand for those more than 5,000 calls or what software do you use? Uh, yes. Um, so we had a, a MATLAB routine which displayed the spectrogram. And then I had to point to the start, to the end, to the midpoint, the maximum and minimum, and click on each of those to take the measurements. So it wasn't fully automated. Uh, I know there are options to do that automatically, um, but this was uh, a routine uh, we had available. And in the beginning of my master's, I didn't expect, uh, I didn't really know how long it would take. So I just started and yeah, it took a long time. <laughs> suffer a little bit for your research. Um, okay, we have, Anne says, great talk, Anna. Um, if both Iceland and Norway populations are herring specialists, but only Iceland has the herding call, do whales in Norway herd without that call or do they use a different strategy? Uh, no, so the feeding strategy is uh, relatively similar. So like I said, the whales kind of swim in circles around the herring and try to like bunch the whole school really close together and then slap the tail. Um, we know that in no way people describe that they often see the herring uh, jumping at the surface. So it seems that they also use the surface as a boundary to push the fish against. Uh, in Iceland, we don't see that very often or maybe never, at least I've never seen it. Um, so it seems that maybe they are hunting a little bit deeper, but they use the similar strategy. Very cool. Um, is the population size known for the different groups? Um, there are some estimates, but it's um, very difficult to estimate uh, these because we don't really know the boundaries of the population. So um, I know that in Iceland, we have about 430 individuals that we have photo identified. So that's basically the minimum we know that we have. Uh, in Norway, it's much more, it's I think over a thousand that they have um, identified in photos. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that, there are some uh, from like uh, bigger surveys, there are some estimates, but I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Sorry. It's not easy to do even with, with photo ID. Yeah, um, for exactly. those who might not know, can you talk just a little briefly about how photo ID is done with killer whales? Uh, yeah, I'll quickly go to one of the pictures where you can see the fin. So, uh, or maybe even better. So in killer whales, we use the dorsal fin to, to identify individuals. And this one you can see is quite easy to identify because it has this a nice nick here that is also seen in this photo here. But we also use the saddle patch. So the saddle patch is this gray part uh, that has often a lot of scars and scratches. So that's what we what is used to to identify them. Great. Um, Victorine is wondering which master's or internship internship experiences would you recommend to a young graduate 
uh, who's interested in marine biology or oceanography and also in killer whales and especially in acoustic work. Oh, wow, that's a bit tricky. It depends where you are and where you want to be. Um, so the way I came to this project was um, sort of random. <laughs> I wanted to do acoustics, I knew that. And I was in Iceland because I was working here. Um, and I started looking uh, into the research people do here. And because Iceland is quite small, it was, you know, it was a quick research really. <laughs> and I started contacting people uh, of projects that I was interested in. So I think if you're looking for projects it's, um, it's really important to, to think about uh, what you are really interested in. Like, which topic within acoustics, because acoustics is also a really big topic. But if you don't know, that's also fine. I mean, then just try to think about the species you're interested in and look up people that work in this uh, area and contact them. I mean, I sent a lot of emails before I got my project. So, and yeah, don't be discouraged by getting negative answers. Um, if you have the chance to go to conferences and talk to people directly, of course, that's very good. Uh, but it's quite difficult in these times. Um, and yeah, then I guess it also depends if you are, um, if you have something in your local area, I mean, that's obviously easier and, and, and the best way to go. Uh, I don't know if that really helps. I've also noticed that a lot of people advertise a lot of stuff on Twitter. So if you don't have Twitter, get Twitter and follow all the people that you're that the research interests you. I think the persistence of emails and you know sending follow up emails if you don't receive a response in the first place is a great piece of advice. That's yeah, really or maybe even pick up the phone. It's maybe a bit more scary, but might work better. <laughs> revolutionary concept. Um, so we have a question from Christina that, um, Christina, please message again if what I asked doesn't quite match what you're asking. And I think what she's asking is, um, do the, the killer whales make particular sounds in response to mourning behaviors? Like if, an, if another animal dies or something like that, are there sounds associated with that that they might make? Ooh. That's a good question. Um, I have no idea. I don't think, at least I'm not aware that anybody studied that so far, because I imagine it would be quite difficult because you would have to be in the right time at the right place to record that. Uh, so there's really nothing that I can tell you about it. Open area of potential research. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the the con the connection between uh, sounds and behavior is not very well understood at all. So that's definitely a really interesting uh, research area. Great, thank you, Daryl. Do you have other questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, I go ahead and ask. Um, so you you indicated that you might. Uh, better re resolution between uh, looking at connectivity between the, the uh, places, uh, I guess, Norway and Iceland, where you haven't seen, if you had an improved classification system. So what would you do to improve classification system to uh, potentially get that resolution? So yeah, the classification we used was basically a manual classification. So uh, it was me classifying and a second observer uh, classifying, and then we compared the results. Um, but there are automated methods to do that. Um, so far, they have been performing similar to human observers in, in the classification of kilo whale sounds. Um, but we actually have another PhD student who is working on an automated classification method called Artwarp, which has been used before. Um, and this is something we want to use to kind of 
test our classification of the catalog that we made um, and, and compare how, how the human classification uh, compares to the, to the machine classification. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? If not, I've got a couple more I might ask, or at least one more. Nothing else right now, I'd say go ahead. Okay, so if I understood you correctly, um, you said that the length of time for uh, change in, in repertoire has not been long enough for one to show up. So then, why don't you, I, you may not be able to answer this, I don't know, but my question is, why don't you then see some connectivity between Norway and Iceland if in fact you, it's known that there was movement between these two groups? Well, yeah, our hypothesis is that um, if there was movement before between these groups that they were probably not uh, not that well connected, so that they were not completely, like a completely mixed population. But also the, uh, the evidence is relatively scarce. We don't really have any photo matches uh, because there was no research going on before the before the herring stock collapsed. So, I mean, we know that in theory, kilowatts can cover the distance, but we don't know if any actually ever did. So the, the, the evidence for the contact comes mostly from these whaling uh, operations. Um, and yeah, it looks like there was a continuous distribution, but um, also their seasonality, so which doesn't come across in the map that I showed. So we don't really know for sure that there was contact before. Thank you. Um, do we have further questions from the audience? We do have two that have come in. So um, we have, um, what is the ratio of stereotyped calls to variable calls in the different populations? Um, I think it was about 90% stereotype calls uh, to about 10% variable calls uh, in, in both of the, in the Icelandic and the Norwegian population. So yeah, it's really the majority that is stereotyped. And then related to that, um, Mauricio is wondering, is it feasible to identify different ecotypes based on these different stereotype vocalizations? Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely feasible. Um, like that's what they've been doing in the North Pacific so that they can really, just from the sounds, just from the calls, they can identify whether it's the transient, the mammal eating killer whales or the fish eating resident killer whales. Um, but we don't really know. Well, in Iceland, it's a bit tricky because we know that some of the whales that go to Scotland when they, or to Shetland when they are there, they have been seen hunting seals. But in Iceland, we only have ever seen them eating fish. So there's a lot that we need to learn about these whales. Great. Feel free to continue asking questions for those who are watching. We will keep answering them. But Daryl, if you have anything else, now is a good time. All right, I guess I'll just ask one more. And that is, have you looked at connectivity between other locations and um, um, Iceland in the North Atlantic? Um, not much, uh, but it's something that we are kind of working on. So there is a plan to have a big uh, photo ID comparison across all the locations uh, from the North Atlantic. Um, and for example, from Shetland, there's more and more uh, research coming from there. So there's more photos coming, more uh, recordings coming. So there is a lot of potential and there's a lot of uh, places where, you know, we, 
we get random uh, bits of information from. Um, but yeah, it's it's really something that um, we hope to do in the future to really compare all of these uh, locations. And we are all also having um, acoustic uh, mode deployments, which are placed off the northeast of Iceland, uh, further offshore. So these would also be very interesting to look at uh, for the sounds. So we have a question we'd like to ask on behalf of students, um, which you've kind of answered, but along with the sort of emails and persistence, do you have other advice for students looking to get into this field? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, I mean, a lot of this is also luck, I guess. Um, in my case, I knew I wanted to work on acoustics. I wasn't so fixed on the species. Um, so I think, you know, it's good if you know what you want, but also be a bit flexible because you might end up in an amazing project on killer whales <laughs> that you never thought about before. So, um, yeah, I think, um, it's it's and if you're looking for a program or like say a master's program or even an undergraduate program uh just make sure you you check um the university and you check if there's any research going on there and or maybe you know in my case uh my my supervisor wasn't uh, in the university at the time but she was in an institute that was Close, close by, so there are always different options. So don't be too fixed on one, one way to do it. That's great. Be open to all the possibilities that are out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. We have maybe yep. one last question, Daryl, that just came in. Um, ask okay, about call types of, of pilot whales between Iceland and Norway. I don't know if you know anything about pilot whale call types. Um, whew, that's a, <laughs> a whole nother story. <laughs> so um, we, we have started doing some research here in Iceland on pilot whales, and that's part of my uh, PhD project now. And we've been working also with um, people that have been doing research on pilot whales in Norway. Um, but as far as I know, there has not been a, any comparison between the two locations. And we have very few recordings here from Iceland. Um, I mean, I did like an informal comparison and I saw that they didn't quite look the same, but it's uh, in no way uh, anything conclusive. Um, what is a problem with pilot whales is that they tend to be in huge groups and they tend to make a lot of sounds. So you have a lot of overlap and it's really difficult to isolate the call types and to really look at the contour of, of single calls. So that's for sure a cool project there if somebody <laughs> wants to look into. All kinds of brainstorming. We have another question um, from Annika. The future hydrophone deployments that you just described, um, are you planning on long-term or more seasonal or short-term deployments? Um, these are, as far as I know, I'm not really directly involved in it. Uh, as far as I know, they are relatively long term, a couple of months, and then they are usually exchanged and put out again. So um, yeah, I would have to ask one of my supervisors about details, but if you want to know, just email us. <laughs> it sounds like you're saying you have maybe somewhat continuous coverage. It's not yeah. even if you have to replace them over time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Annika says she'll reach out to you. <laughs> I expect an email. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so it is one o'clock. We've uh, kept you busy with questions, uh, probably 
sufficiently long. So let, let me just say thank you, Anna, for an excellent talk. Um, and uh, um, maybe you'll get some contact from others who have been listening with further questions. But uh, uh, appreciate you taking the time to talk about your uh, work being published. And um, perhaps we'll see further work being published as you proceed in your PhD work. So. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, thanks. And I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and sign off. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great. And thanks for all the great questions. And yeah, you can see my email on the screen. So feel free to get in touch. Great. Thank you much again. Thank you. Thank you. And just a reminder to everyone that we'll have the recording on YouTube if you do need more information or you want to get Anna's email or something like that. Thank you, Teresa. Yep. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Uh, hopefully, uh, see you on uh, next month with our talk. Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, what that talk is, but uh, pay attention to the announcement on the Society for Marine Mammology's website. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>